bless you and welcome. I'm my name is Frank too, like I obviously you know that. <laughs> but what I want to cover today in the Word is something really important. Now, in the Word of God, when Jesus teaches, he teaches that which the people are familiar with, things that they in contact with. When he talks about the um, uh, no man put new wine into old bottles, and we know, as I've taught you, that the bottles are lambskins or goat skins. So, and, the, and the, that's what it's talking about. So I'm talking about a glass bottle because we assume the glass bottle is what we're familiar with. So we have this what's called a default assumption where we, own, we recognize our own um, experiences as valid and then we relate to whatever someone says with our own experiences. This can be a real major handicap when it comes to the word. So I'm going to try and open up an aspect of the word using the latest scientific discoveries that might help. And back in 18, uh, 1939, they're dredging off uh, Japan and they pulled up a little creature. And what it had was this, um, it was, they apparently pulled it up from around 2,000 feet. Now, when they pulled it up, it, it actually exploded and they try and put the piece back together and they took a picture of it and they called it the um, Macropina uh, micro um, stoma. And, and, and also be called, it was called the barrel fish, the barrel eye fish. So that's, or the ghost fish. And of course, people were like, wow, that's really interesting. How could this thing even survive? Well, what they've got is the, frac the, the, the fragments of it because down at that depth at 2,000 feet or, or 2,600 feet, the pressure is 1,000 pounds per square inch. That's a lot of pressure. So when you bring this little creature up, well, not little, but you know, a good-sized creature, you bring it up, he's pushing out that much, and when they brought him to the surface, he explodes. Just like if we were thrown out in space, we would like, you know, have major problems too. And all we've got pushing on us is 14 pounds, but down at that depth, pff, it's a thousand pounds. But let me introduce you to him, all right? This is him. I'm not, this is a picture of him. <laughs> all right, this is him. Now, you'll notice that there's something unique about him. He's got really sad eyes, right? You see him? He's got really sad eyes. Well, those aren't eyes. Those little dots right here, those things, those little dots, those are, that's his, his it's called a nariz, which means a nose. That's his nose, his olfactory senses, what he's sensing in the water. Above that, in here, this dome is, is filled with liquid and it magnifies light for these little green objects. These green objects are his eyes. Those are his eyes. It is not his brain, it's his eyes. His brain is down there, underneath that. But these are his eyes. Now what happens with this fish, swimming at anywhere from 2,000 to 2,600 feet below the surface in the, in the ocean, and of course not just anywhere, it's, I mean, it's everywhere off the coast around the equatorial area, which is like, you know, between California and Mexico. In fact, this one was taken off the coast of California. But it's also found in the Atlantic, it's found in the Indian Ocean, so it's found off the coast of Japan. This little creature is absolutely phenomenal. He, he's, he floats in the water. Now understand, at that depth, there is no more light, right? It's like at that, at, at 1,000 feet, you basically have a half a percent of the light coming through. But at 2,000 feet, 2,600, how much light is there? Like nothing. Can you say nothing? <laughs> it's like there's nothing there. So what happens is he, he now that doesn't mean there's no light because the animals all around him at that level, all, all of the animals have what's called bioluminescence. They're all glowing, but they're glowing to attract other fish so they can eat them. So they got little, little glow lights and there's fish that have a little, 
little angler and they dangle it next to their mouth. And when any animal comes to look at it, then they eat them. They got big teeth and they're really all these ugly, gross creatures. But this little guy seems to survive all the time. And he's got lots of distractions. He's in total darkness. He's got light all around him, but he doesn't pay attention to it. He only looks straight up. He, he floats in that state with his, his, those two eyes of his focusing straight up. Now, as he only looks up so he can see what's coming down, he doesn't care what's on all around him or anything. He only cares about what's coming down. And he can examine it, look at it, weigh it, I mean, judge it, and then he'll tilt his head up. But those green, that, those green objects, now the reason you can see him is because it took a special film to see him at that depth. This was in 2004, we finally found him. It was a, it was a, a, MERS, a, a, a autonomous MERS or, or sub, submersible, and they, they found him, and they're like, whoa! And they had no idea what he looked like without this, because all the, the species they ever had, anything they found didn't have the membrane. It was all burst. But here, you can see that there's a thin membrane, and it's filled with fluid to magnify the light. And here are his two eyes. And they're huge. They're, they're ultra-sensitive to the light. But only light coming from what? Above. Now, granted, there's little creatures here. You can see these these little things like right here and there, that's bioluminescence. That's the little creatures with light. And he's ignoring them. He's looking only what? Above. So in the absolute darkness, he only looks up and waiting for food. Now that is phenomenal. And as the food passes, he maneuvers himself until his eyes, and his eyes that are normal horizontal, will come up vertical watching the food, and then he will eat it and he's got a little bitty mouth. He'll smell it with the nose, and then he'll eat it. So he'll be able to judge whether it's really good to eat. But it has to come from what? Above. Now that is unbelievable. No fish that is anywhere even similar to this that only looks above in the midst of absolute darkness to be fed. And there's a lot of great similes in this with God's word. So what I'd like to do now is to move into another section, but this one's pretty interesting. If you grab your Bibles, I'm sure you have some or have one. And in Genesis, I know it's, we're going to start at the beginning. <laughs> we have an account of someone called Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. It reads as follows, verse 11. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because it was because his, the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them there for his what? Pillows. And lay down in that place to sleep. Okay. Now, obviously, there's something wrong here. How many have ever slept on something really hard? All right. This... Okay, imagine if it was a rock. <laughs> like, what? Why, why would you sleep on a pillow that was, made, that was a rock? You understand? That, that makes zero sense. But then again, it does if you understand the culture. Now, we don't have anything like that here. We don't. We're, our Greek and Roman culture doesn't acknowledge us or understand this. Because when you are, but, but in this Bible culture to which the word of God is written, it is absolutely necessary. Remember I was talking about the, the barrel eye fish, how it constantly looks up for that to receive from above. Well, that concept is in the word a lot. And when we look at how people sleep, we see the word pillow, and I'm going to show you a pillow from the Middle East, right? Saudi Arabia, more likely. This is a pillow. I know it doesn't look like a pillow. Japan has this. China has this. The Middle East has it. Africa has it. This is a pillow. 
And you may think, that is the stupidest looking pillow I've ever seen, right? But what its purpose is, is to put the back of your head here and face upward. Why? Because God is. God is. He is. So when we come to the word, we, we don't understand. Well, what is this talking about a rock? Well, let me show you. Here are some other headrests. These are pillows. Now, you'll notice on these pillows that basically, you know, this comes from Tunankum's tomb. And that's gold and that's lapis lazuli. And it's, it's a beautiful uh, headrest. And then here's another one that's kind of like an X shape made of ivory to hold the head. Here's one that's made out of stone. Here's one that was taken from another, um, from a neck, uh, necropolis. It was found there. And this is made out of wood here. Basically, it just holds the head facing upward. That's all it's for. You're not supposed to lay on it and stuff. Why? That sounds like a really uncomfortable and undesirable position to be in. If you understand why someone would do that, because people who live with these, these pillows like this to keep their head facing upward is because they acknowledge something as real. And that, that which is real is God. Let me show you. Now, here you see that he did this. Put the stones for his what? Pillow. Now, what you can do is you find one that's curved, or you can take two rocks, and you can put a, um, a sheepskin in between it and put your head so the two rocks are side by side, and that gap is where you would hold your head. So it's to keep you looking up, because God may call on you at what? Any time. And we go, oh, I wouldn't stand for that. That's right. That's why it's not written to our culture. This is written for people who know God is, and they want to hear from him. They want God's knowledge, God's perspective, God's reality, not what they think or what anyone else thinks. So when you see this account, did he get, that's why it's mentions, he took the stones as his pillow. He's going to God. And then, does God talk to him? Ah, yeah. And you'll see this over and over again in the Bible where it's all orientated to expect to hear from God. So if God is, then if you expect to hear from him, then you're going to get it. So let's go into Psalms. Psalms chapter 1. Job, Psalms. Psalm 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the... Um, Walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, except those who are separate from God, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, not he, what he likes, his what? Delight is in the law of the Lord. Now, the law of the Lord is, just means the truth. It's not law. It's like the law of gravity. Well, where is the law of gravity written? It's, it, it, there's no law of gravity. You just, it's, it's, it's truth. You can, you can go against it, but there's consequences. So life has laws that if you break them, there's emotional, mental, and physical consequences. So it's not like there's the people could not live with that. So God wrote a law, which Moses wanted, but that's not what God wanted. But that's a whole nother teaching. So, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, the truth, that which is real, doth he meditate what? Day and what? Whoa! How do you meditate when you're sleeping? How do you meditate when you're sleeping? I can see deep meditation and thought on something to where you're working it in your mind and your heart. But how about when you're sleeping? Ta-da! That's where the pillow comes in. You go to sleep looking up to God, and then you wake up looking up to God. So you begin that way. Now, I know there's a scripture about holy hands. Well, when you put your head on this, facing up, you lift you, you inhale, 
right? You inhale, putting your hands here, and you inhale, and then you exhale, and you let it all go to God, and you lift up your hands to him. And then you bring them down, and you wait for God's guidance. You're expecting God's guidance. We don't do that. We don't want God to bother us at all. We don't want anyone to bother us when we're sleeping. If I put my head down, I don't want nobody to disturb me, not even the alarm clock. If the alarm clock wakes me up, I'm, it's going to travel across the room, right? But that's ridiculous. There's, it's a whole different orientation. When someone, we have right now what's called, they call it a pandemic. Though it's far less than SARS and MERS ever was. It's a, those are also corona. But nonetheless, we call it a pandemic. And yet it's far less. And but people just believe it. They just they walk around because they be, they've never seen it. They never they don't know what it looks like. They don't even know anything about it except someone says you gotta put a mask on. So don't walk around like this with a mask. That's ridiculous. A virus is so much smaller than a molecule, so much smaller than a cell, so much smaller than a bacteria. And if you're talking about viruses, it's like smoke going through, you know, where you got to have a barrier. Yeah, it's like smoke going through a screen door. So a screen door is not going to stop anything. But anyway, nonetheless, we, we're in this country. We follow the rules. We follow the laws. But meditating day and night is to accept the reality, not of a virus, or the, the presence of God. And that's everything. That's why Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of what? God. So we're supposed to, in our heart, we're supposed to love God with all our what? Heart. That's our perception of reality. How we see things from God's perspective. The word love is agape. It changes our thinking and alignment with that that we're focusing, that we're agape. So meditate day and night. So what do you do? Well, if you go to sleep, thinking about God, and you wake up with God on your mind, then pretty much you've meditated all night, and you can have some really awesome dreams. <laughs> because that's what you're doing. You're looking what? Up. In the midst of total insanity, in your heart, your soul, your mind, you're looking what? Up. Waiting God's guidance. You're like that micro, what is it, micropina, macropina, micro soma which is what the barrel fish is called, this little guy. And yet he's everywhere. He's prolific. He's everywhere at 2,500 feet underwater, but no light, enemies everywhere, and he survives because he only looks up. All these great men and women in here, what do they do? They go to sleep on a rest, a headrest to keep their heads up. If you've got your eye, if your head's on one side, you're not going to hear anything. You're turned away from God. And that's, they, that's totally unacceptable. So all the people of the East, they are oriented to the reality of God. So let's go into Hebrews. This looks at the great superheroes, the Hall of Fame. And it says in verse 6, now, it's talking about chapter 11, and we have verse 4. It says, by pistis, Abel. It doesn't say faith. I know we have faith. When people, I, people, when, how many here had faith that there was Santa Claus, had faith that there was, faith that there was Easter Bunny, had faith that there was the Tooth Fairy? That's great, but that's not true. It's what's been taught, it's what's been said, but what's the facts? What's the truth? So when we're talking about pistis, it's that now you talk to a virologist about the coronavirus. Listen to him. He's got the pistis, the developed growth and, and knowledge, wisdom and understanding. Not the academics, the people that are working in the field. So, verse 6, without pistis, growth and development is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must 
pistil, he must have that understanding. He must be ready at that point in knowledge, wisdom, and what? Understanding. That he is. Who is? God is. Well, how do you know God is? How do you know he is not? How do you find out? Well, how do you know there's a, the SARS or MERS? How do you find out? This is the importance. You've got to know if, if you, if you, it's got to be falsifiable. Everything that's truth is falsifiable. So you put it to the test, and if it's false, bingo. What did you do wrong? How did you misunderstand it? When it comes to God, God says, prove me, which means put me to the what? Test. Not once, not, he's all through here. Put me to the test. Not what you think, but what God has said. Because God is not a man that he should lie. So here we go. For he that cometh to God must, and this is that pistio, it's an action of learning, gaining knowledge and wisdom. That he, God, is, and that he, God, is a rewarder of them that diligently, what? What's diligently mean? Well, diligently, if you lost your car keys at home and you had to go to work, you would be diligently working, uh, looking for them. Does that make sense? If you had a paycheck and you lost it when you got home, you would be diligently looking for it. So this is the difference between the average person and say someone like Abel, Enoch, Abraham, Noah, Sarah, all these people, all these examples, know that God is. Well, if you know that God is, then when do you want him to bother you? Receiving anything from God, any knowledge, wisdom, understanding is not a bother for me. I want my heart, the eyes in my heart, my soul, my mind to be looking up, my ears to be ready to hear. How often? All the time. Do I sleep? I'll give you three guesses how I sleep. Do I use these? No. I put my pillow and make it so that it's like, <laughs> like that V shape. So my head sits in the middle and I look up. But I'm, that's because that's where my heart's at. I want to understand. I want to know how to apply it. I want to gain more knowledge. Is that where you are? Let's go into Matthew. And in Matthew, Chapter 6, verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth. Well, what are treasures? Treasures are anything that you spend the most time thinking about. For instance, a philatelist, one who collects stamps. What does he think about all the time? Stamps. What does the numismatist think about? Coins. So if I gave a $10,000 stamp to a coin collector, what would he do? Sell it and buy some coins. You understand? So what's a treasure to one may not be to another. Whatever you spend the most time on, that's your treasure. What do you think the most about? That's your treasure. Lay not for yourselves treasures or the majority of your thinking upon earth. Where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Verse 20. But lay up for yourselves treasures, the majority of your thinking, in heaven or of heavenlies, right? The fullness of where God exists. Where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through and steal. Verse 21. For reason, where your treasure is, why the majority of your thinking, there will be your heart also. What you value. What you feel is the purpose of your life. Verse 22. The light of the body is the what? The eye. What eye? What eye? The left? The right? No. There's another eye. It's inside you. Inside your mind. 
I say Apple. Bing, what just popped into your head? Which eye are you seeing it with, the left or the right? No. It's in your head. It's in your head. Is the images in your head from God or is it of the world? And if it is of the world, every time you've had things that you thought were true and valuable, what happened to them? They dissolved. They became of no value. Value that which is of God. Have the majority of your thinking from God's point of view. His truth. The lie of the body is the eye. That's what you see and how you perceive it. If you walk into the kitchen and my wife's got a big knife in her hand, would that bother you? No, she's cutting up something. If, if, she, if you're out in the park, if you are in, uh, outside her house in your car and she approaches you with a knife, would that bother you? Now, there's something wrong there, right? But a knife shouldn't bother you. But it's not the knife, it's what area, where, where is it located at? Where does it not belong? See what I'm saying? It's not what you see, it's how you what? Perceive it. What is the context of it, the environment it's in? Nothing is evil itself, but what's the intention of those who have it? What's the intention of those who are teaching or knowledging or having knowledge? For what purpose? The lie of the body is the eye. Therefore, thine eye be single. Only one place. Not around, like, but only what? Upward. That which is pleasing to God. Thy whole body shall be filled with what? Light. But if thy eye be evil, that's not from above, but from anywhere else around. Just like that, that little fish, if he, not little fish, but if he had looked at the, uh, things or the lights around him and pursued that, it would have been the end of his life. There's some ugly looking things down there. Verse 23, but if thy eye be evil, thy whole body should be filled with darkness. And therefore, the light that is in thee be darkness. And that's what those fish down there have. They have light. But it's a lure to capture and take. To use. How great is that darkness? No man can serve to what? Masters. In other words, there's two. There's that which is of God. And that which is from other than God. Either he will hate the one and love the other. Or else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God. The thoughts and images that come from above. And what? Mammon, which is of the world. So, do you exist? Are you real or should I just have faith that you exist like Santa Claus and Easter Bunny? And to know that you exist, I need to know your thoughts, your images, your priorities. And then I understand and know you. It's about time we really take it seriously. That God is. And we need to know more of his knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. So that we can truly as it says in Psalms, be blessed in every way. God bless you. You're God's wife. Best.